on this Thursday night, no longer on the run. The FBI arrests this former Canadian military reservist and suspected recruiter for a neo-Nazi group. We have received credible intelligence. The imminent attack Patrick Matthews and others are accused of plotting. Millions of Canadians in the deep freeze. The cold, hard facts about this cold snap contradicting the American president about the Ukraine scandal. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. An associate of Trump's own lawyer on the record. Plus, a $700,000 hockey penalty. It's a lot of money, my dear. Why a judge is ordering a beer league player to pay up. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a major break in the investigation into a former Canadian Army reservist who is alleged to have ties to a neo-Nazi group. Patrick Matthews has been arrested by the FBI nearly five months after disappearing from his home in Manitoba. For months, the FBI have been investigating a notorious neo-Nazi group known as the Base. Police believe they were planning to travel to a pro-gun rally next week in Virginia. Fearing violence at that rally, the state's governor declared a state of emergency. Matthews now faces two weapons charges in the U.S. In our top story tonight, Mike Drolet explains what more we know. For months after Patrick Matthews disappeared at the Manitoba border, he lived in the shadows until the FBI knocked down the door of the Delaware apartment he was renting. He was arrested along with two other alleged members of an aggressive neo-Nazi group called The Base. This morning they felt that they had to act, right, because these guys had, you know, they had guns, they had 1,600 rounds of ammunition, they had vests for body armor, right? Uh, so, you know, it seemed like they, they might have been up to they might have been up to no good. Matthews had trained to be an explosives expert in the Canadian forces. Global News had previously reported he had been the subject of a covert military intelligence investigation for his alleged beliefs. But it was a Winnipeg Free Press report into his suspected role as a trainer and recruiter for the base that led to his disappearance. And based on an affidavit filed today, it seems the FBI was watching him closely. Because he was, you know, former Canadian Army, a combat engineer. You know, I'm told he was extremely motivated, right? And, uh, you know, it seemed like he might be willing to, 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 you know, to engage in violence. Hate crime experts say the base is a group that believes in triggering a race war so that they can create an ethno-white state. So these accelerationists, uh, as we refer to them, uh, are very keen not just to wait for, uh, you know, the great masses to wake up and to recognize, uh, you know, their their loss of place, um, but are happy to engage in uh, what might be offensive violence, not just defensive violence. The timing of the arrests coincides with a state of emergency declared in Virginia just days before a planned pro-gun rally is set to take place. U.S. authorities have reported an increase in online chatter between alt-right groups planning to attend, including the base. But we have received credible intelligence from our law enforcement agencies that there are groups with malicious plans for the rally that is planned for Monday. This includes out-of-state militia groups and hate groups. If convicted, Matthews faces up to 10 years in prison for each of the two weapons-related charges he's facing. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. The other top story of the day is the weather. From coast to coast to coast, Canadians are dealing with powerful winds, heavy snowfall and extreme cold. Environment Canada has issued weather alerts, many of them extreme cold warnings, in every single province and territory in the country. Roughly 20 million Canadians are caught in this, warned to brace for potentially dangerous weather conditions. Hardest hit is almost the entire province of Alberta, gripped for another day of roughly minus 45 with the wind chill. Global's Quinn Oler is in Edmonton tonight. Quinn, it's been so cold there for so long. How are people dealing with it? Well, Donna, it has been so cold for so long and it's dangerous. So people are really bundling up, staying inside as much as they can. And if they do have to be outside, they're making their way inside with lots of breaks. As I mentioned, it's dangerously cold here. I've lived here my entire life and I feel like this is the longest that it has been this cold and that we've dealt with this. Today here in Edmonton, we had a high of minus 26 degrees, minus 37 when you factor in the wind chill. Now, that actually seems 
pretty warm for what we've been dealing with over the last couple of days. It's colder here than the South Pole. Other parts of our province are seeing minus 40 or minus 50 with the wind chill. Edmontonians are used to it, though. We're doing what we can and dreaming of those warmer days. Donna? I bet you are. Quinn Oler in Edmonton, thanks. Well, Canadians are used to the cold, of course, and it is the middle of winter. But even in Manitoba, the deep freeze of minus 33 was a bit much today. Brittany Greenslade reports. The trails are groomed, the rinks flooded and ready, but these normally bustling winter activity spots are empty. This is a little bit extreme. I don't think there's too many brave souls out there today. Today, the entire province of Manitoba hit temperatures below minus 30 at times. The extreme cold, even too cold for most Winnipeggers. No, I don't go outside anymore. I just don't want like four weeks of it in a row. The temperatures hit dangerously low levels where frostbite can occur within minutes, leaving the city's most vulnerable looking for places to stay warm. I got blankets, I got a, I got a heater, and I got myself uh, my, my art pad and just do some drawings. While others are still searching after the city was forced to dismantle a homeless camp after a teepee caught fire when a resident fell asleep with a campfire still burning. They lost some of that housing with the TP that burned down anyway, so they were really within their own encampment struggling to have space. The weather's dipped very, very cold now. And while the cold has most people rushing to the indoors, others are still trying to make the best of it. I don't think it could ever get too cold for us. Now today in Winnipeg, it was minus 33, but that wind chill made it feel more like minus 45. But there is some good news in the forecast. Tomorrow, it's expected to warm up to a balmy minus 10. Donna? Woohoo, Brittany Greenslade in Winnipeg, thanks. Meteorologist Ross Hull is at the Global News Weather Center. Ross, what's in store for the rest of the West? Donna, still some extreme cold to deal with across the prairies for the end of the week, into the weekend. So B.C., Alberta into Saskatchewan. But then as the weekend progresses into next week, that cold moves out and a Pacific flow moves in. So some milder air. In fact, above average temperatures expected for many parts of the southern prairie. Chinook conditions likely around southern Alberta. And with that Pacific flow, some steady rain for the B.C. coast and milder conditions the combination of the two could bring some flooding. So that is a story to watch in the coming days. Now that cold air barreling east combining with some Atlantic moisture, a blizzard on the way to Newfoundland Friday into the early part of Saturday. This system will be intensifying. It will be a weather bomb, meaning it's pressure dropping at least 24 millibars within 24 hours. Strong winds, some areas could see 70 centimeters of snow across the Avalon coupled with winds of around 150 kilometers per hour. The system moves out on Saturday, and there's likely another system on the way for early next week. Winter is just getting started. Donna. Okay, Ross Hull, thanks. There's a new international demand for answers about how and why Iranian missiles shot down that passenger plane in Iran. Foreign ministers from Canada and the four other countries which lost citizens met today at the Canadian High Commission in London. They paid tribute to the 176 people who died and then sat down to hash out a list of demands for Iran. As Crystal Gamansing reports, the question is getting Iran to cooperate. Bonded by grief, government leaders from Canada, Ukraine, Sweden, Afghanistan and Britain put their unity on display. A moment of silence quickly moving to a meeting and a list of diplomatically worded demands for Iran. I think what the world is asking today is full accountability and full transparency and full cooperation by Iran. The Canadian-led group agreed to five points during the day-long meeting. Key among them, international observers involved in every step of Iran's investigation. They're also calling for Iran to identify victims' remains with dignity, an independent and credible criminal investigation, compensation, and accountability for those responsible. That's where the Netherlands comes in. They were invited because of their experience dealing with a long and detailed investigation of down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. In 2014, the passenger plane was shot down over eastern Ukraine. 298 people died. I know how important it is to the relatives and the friends of the deceased that 
uh, governments do their utmost to achieve truth and justice about what has happened. Iran did take responsibility for shooting down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 last week, but it's pulling the United States into its circle of blame, saying ongoing fighting had members of its Revolutionary Guard on edge. All parties are urging Iran to keep cooperating. We will judge Iran when it comes to the investigation as to whether uh, international experts will be allowed to join in the investigation. Uh, we judge Iran on the fact that um, in the case of Canada, because you were asking me, the Transport Safety Board, two experts are now in Tehran, and we have offered also to have experts uh, being there to help when the black box are going to be uh, open. Canada was delayed in getting to the crash site by several days. Officials were in Turkey waiting for visas to be approved, so not all requests are being dealt with in a timely fashion. At this point, the grieving nations can only assume that Iran wants to be seen as a cooperative player in the eyes of the international community. Donna? Crystal Gamansing in London, thanks. Ontario is creating 57 post-secondary scholarships to honour the Canadian victims of Flight 752. Premier Doug Ford says the scholarships will be $10,000 each. They'll be awarded on academic merit and financial need. More than a dozen post-secondary institutions in Ontario lost students or faculty members in the disaster. The tensions in the Middle East appear to have eased a little bit, allowing the Canadian forces to resume some operations in Iraq. Global's investigative reporter Stuart Bell is in Kuwait City tonight, the headquarters of Canada's mission in Iraq. Stuart? Well, it's been just over a week since the Canadian military put their operation in Iraq on pause following the U.S. airstrike that killed the Quds Force leader Qasem Soleimani. But uh, Thursday, the military did say that some of their operations had now resumed. That includes transport flights into Iraq to supply the troops. And some special operations uh, activities have also been allowed to carry on now under what the military is calling strict parameters. We are constantly assessing the threat. We are constantly making decisions that would be applicable to ensure the protection of the force and positioning ourselves to be ready to whatever comes next. The United States has also returned to its fight against ISIS in northern Iraq, but a Canadian military spokesperson said that safety remained the priority for the Canadian troops and that the training mission remained on hold for now. Stuart Bell, Global News, Kuwait City. Another legal hurdle has been cleared for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project. The Supreme Court of Canada has dismissed an appeal of a lower court ruling. It found interprovincial trade is federal jurisdiction and the flow of commodities like heavy oil and bitumen should be overseen by federal regulators. B.C. was trying to fight that. The project was sold to the federal government for $4.5 billion. It will nearly triple the capacity of the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline that carries oil from Edmonton to Burnaby, B.C. President Trump called a liar. Coming up, conflicting stories on who knew what in the campaign to pressure Ukraine. The plot is thickening in the impeachment trial of President Trump, a man who played a central role in the campaign to pressure Ukraine to investigate political rivals of President Trump, is talking. And Lev Parnas says the president, despite his denials, was fully aware of the efforts to dig up damaging information. In an interview on MSNBC, he said Trump knew exactly what was going on. He said about you and Mr. Fruman, Igor Fruman, I don't know those gentlemen, I don't know about them, I don't know what they do. You're saying that was not a true statement from the president. He lied. Parnas says he regrets trusting President Trump and his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and wants the world to know the truth. That's what the impeachment trial is working towards, too. Jackson Prosco has the latest developments on that. Do you solemnly swear that in all things appertaining to the trial of the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States, now pending, you will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and the laws, so help you God. I do. Swearing in the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and the 100 U.S. Senators who will act as jurors, so help you God. The impeachment trial of President Donald Trump began in earnest. With two articles, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress, hand-delivered to the Senate for consideration. I think it should go very quickly. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. Everybody knows that. It's a, it's a complete hoax. The White House wants a short trial and a speedy acquittal at the hands of the Republican majority. 
President Trump knew exactly what was going on. But a bombshell interview with Lev Parnas, a former associate of Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani, could change all that. He was aware of all of my movements. Uh, he, I wouldn't do anything without the consent of Rudy Giuliani or the president. Parnas was involved in the alleged White House scheme to pressure Ukraine to investigate Trump's rival, Joe Biden. I don't know him at all, don't know what he's about, don't know where he comes from, know nothing about him. The new claims are fueling calls for the impeachment trial to hear from witnesses, something Republicans and the president have rejected. The very integrity of the United States Senate is on trial. The precedent in impeachment trials in the Senate is to have witnesses. The White House is also managing the fallout from a damaging new report from the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which says the administration broke the law by withholding military aid to Ukraine. I have never, ever seen a report like this. As all that unfolded in Washington, Ukraine's government announced an investigation of its own, not into Joe Biden as Trump had once wanted, but into reports that former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Marie Ivanovich had been under illegal surveillance by associates of Rudy Giuliani before she was dismissed from her post by the White House. Jackson, the impeachment trial begins next week. How is it expected to unfold? Well, Donna, it's going to start on Tuesday. It will run six days per week, including Saturdays, until it's over. Exactly how long it lasts, though, remains an open question, as does the question of whether or not witnesses will be called. One of the oddities here, Donna, is that even though senators are supposed to be the jurors in this trial, they also get to set the rules for how it's all going to unfold. And Jackson, another big piece of news from the Senate today about a trade deal. What happened? Yes, this is the deal to replace NAFTA. COSMA, as it's known in Canada, USMCA, as it's known here in the U.S., it was passed by the Senate. It now goes to President Trump's desk for a signature. When that happens, still a question. Either way you slice it, it's a major win for Trump to have this deal done. All right, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Ahead, beer league breakthrough, how a hockey player's costly penalty has put the game's rules on thin ice. This next story is a cautionary tale for anyone who plays recreational hockey. An Ontario man has been ordered to pay more than $700,000 after injuring a fellow player. The hit happened back in 2012, and according to a judge, the injured player hasn't been the same since. Abigail Beeman looks at the case and how the hockey community is reacting. I'm terrified of my kids getting hit from behind. Dave Ross refereed hockey for 40 years and has seen his fair share of violence on the ice. They just changed, actually changed the rule now in minor hockey, so a minor penalty for checking from behind is now an automatic one-game suspension. But it's not just a problem in minor hockey. I won't referee men's hockey anymore because I can't deal with all the crap that goes on. An Ontario court ruled one beer league player has to pay another $700,000 in damages for slamming into him during the last minute of a game in 2012. Temporarily knocked unconscious, the judge found Drew Casterton's brain injury left him with permanent damage, and he has never returned to the life he enjoyed before the hit. $700,000? That's a lot of money, my dear. 30 plus years old, the NHL's not calling anymore. You know, have fun, have a good time. After years of criticism, the NHL has slowly moved to take headshots more seriously, but contact still counts for a lot. Body checking, physical contact, is something that's part of the game, has been forever. Um, and that's something that makes the game exciting, appealing, entertaining. Hockey Canada has been proactive, banning body checking for players under 13. Well, I wasn't surprised. Um, it is something we're starting to see trend up. And the Canadian Adult Recreational Hockey Association offers members liability insurance at a cost of $23 a year. What I think we're going to see is uh, maybe municipalities are going to start to mandate liability. Another sign the game so many of us love is evolving at all competitive levels, as our understanding of head injuries does too. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Next, saying goodbye to a legend from Newfoundland and Labrador. There was a rare gathering of political leaders in Newfoundland and Labrador today. Prime Minister Trudeau, joined by former prime ministers and a host of political leaders and former cabinet ministers, all of them there to honour the passing of John Crosby, who died at the age of 88. He was controversial, he was acerbic, and he was charismatic. And he was remembered today for his abiding love of his province. 
in a packed St. John's church, John Crosby was laid to rest in a state funeral. His son Chez remembers him as a man who loved to laugh and was loyal to the core. For our father, politics was a calling to service. He did it oh so well. Crosby's political career spanned five decades. His son says his honesty often got him into hot water. The CBC once wrote that he carries around in that great head a little voice which murmurs from time to time, go ahead, Johnny, say it. Respect for Crosby crossed political lines. Those who came to pay tribute included premiers, current and former, the prime minister, and two previous ones, Joe Clark and Brian Mulroney. There are very few Canadians whose leadership contributions to our country and to Newfoundland and Labrador will resonate as powerfully and as durably in history as the body of work left to us by John Crosby. Crosby's greatest love was his wife, Jane. They were married for 68 years. There could be no more powerful example of the strength and beauty of joining two people than your strong union. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Nicola Lake near Merritt, BC. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to us. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.